telling uh, people that uh, this weekend is about as close to Easter as, I, uh, as Easter Sunday itself, uh, just seeing all these beautiful faces and this beautiful church, uh, the sense that we have begun anew our, our, our journey of faith in the light of 16 months of the pandemic. Uh, in recent weeks, from the Chicago Tribune to the New York Times, from American Magazine to Commonweal, they all are presenting uh, reading lists, you know, books that you should read on these lazy, crazy, hazy days of summer. It's almost the middle of June, so you better grab hold of those lazy, crazy, hazy days before they're not here anymore. But one of the books that's making the rounds in a lot of these lists is a book called The Jeffersonian Bible. It's a biography of Thomas Jefferson with a very interesting slant by the author Paul Mansour. You know, Thomas Jefferson, our third president, was a, in the genius category. You know, he was an architect, an engineer, philosopher, uh, fluent in French. By 18th century standards, he you know, traveled extensively in the world. He was greatly influenced by the forces that uh, led to the French Revolution. A fascinating person, you know, one of those people that you'd probably love to have at dinner. He could talk about anything with great authority. Uh, this book is very interesting because one of the things that Thomas Jefferson did uh, was he wrote his own version of the Bible. Now, he was not apparently not a religious person. He was very intrigued by the ideas of religion, but he didn't claim to be a Christian or a particular denomination. But he loved the Bible. He had several copies of the Bible in various languages in his personal library. And he was particularly intrigued by Jesus Christ, uh, more as an ethical person than anything else. Now, long before cut and paste became part of our vernacular, uh, Thomas Jefferson did a cut and paste job on the Bible. He just deleted whatever he didn't want to hear about in the Bible. Did away with all sorts of things that he didn't agree with. Uh, in Thomas Jefferson's Bible, the lame don't walk, the blind don't see, the hungry aren't fed. He's just focusing on Jesus as an ethical teacher. So the Jesus that emerges out of the Jeffersonian Bible is a rather lifeless person. You know, how you might read Plato in a way, or Socrates. You know, interesting ideas, but who is this person? What are they about? I was thinking about the Gospel today. I, I, I did read the, the Jeffersonian Bible, uh, this, this book on, on, on him, and for instance, in the Scriptures today, the parable of the mustard seed that becomes a tree, the biggest of trees, uh, Thomas Jefferson would be very focused on the science of how a seed, you know, germinates into a bush and into a tree. He would not see any religious meaning or purpose to this parable. So, delete. Um, and uh, the great medieval saint, Saint Bonaventure, so one of the great gifts of faith is to be able to see what others don't see, to hear what others don't hear, to feel what others don't feel. It's a blessed gift. You know, I, I think of this pandemic. Um, can you imagine? I, I, I don't know how a person without faith could have navigated the last 16 months. You know, with all that was happening in the world, if we just saw it as, you know, a series of scientific realities or political realities or however you wanted to interpret the pandemic, you'd sort of miss the whole power of what happened in our society, in our culture. You know, I think of frontline workers who day after day put themselves at great risk for all of us. I think of families, you know, like, I don't know how your family was, our family in the rectory. We've never had so much family time in my uh, priesthood, you know. I mean, wow. You know, I mean, I love having dinner with the guys, but Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So, um, but we got to know each other in ways we, you normally don't get to know another person in a rectory. 
And I think of families, you know. Um, I, I think in my family that the Sunday dinner, uh, which was one of the highlights of the week, but for many families, you know, soccer, baseball, this, that, and the other thing, all of a sudden, we're not getting together anymore. And family parties now, you, you text somebody on their birthday um, rather than, than, than call them. And the great pandemic, you know, re-altered all of those patterns of uh, being able to be together. Not just because we had uh, nothing else to go or we couldn't go any other place, but because we were just together as a family. What a blessing that has been. And I hope as, as, as the world reawakens and regular activity comes back, that we won't lose some of the insights of how important relationships are in life, how important it is to be there for one another, how important it is to think of the needs of others before I focus solely on my own needs. And this is where the eyes of faith come into practice. Um, to be able to see that even in the darkest days of the pandemic, God was working in the world. God was calling us together. God was healing us. God was calling us to courage. God was inviting us to walk with one another. He did not abandon the planet Earth uh, for the past 16 months, but manifested in many different ways the power of faith-filled people making a difference, of being present, of prevailing against the enormous obstacles in, in front of us. You know, I look out at this congregation, you know, several of you in this church had to deal with death uh, during the pandemic. The normal ways you would walk with someone as a family member, you had to, you just, you couldn't be in the hospital, you couldn't be in the nursing home, you couldn't hold their hand. We had funerals, you know, 10 people, you know, um, the families that have gone through that bereavement, that serious illness, kind of put in a whole new perspective what it means to see what others do not see and to hear what others do not hear. God inviting us in a different way uh, to be a community. I'm not sure President Jefferson would understand that. He, he, he wouldn't understand that reality that faith is just not uh, ethical principles. It's a manner of being in the world. It's a way of seeing the world. It's a way of living. It's the foundation out of which choices are made, values are cultivated, beliefs sustained. So on this beautiful summer morning as we hear the story of how the smallest of seeds eventually becomes the largest of bushes and trees, just think of that in terms of our faith. The smallest particle of our faith can be a life-changing force in the course of our human journey, calling us to kindness, to generosity, to being present to one another in this world that's becoming increasingly secular, in some ways becoming increasingly, in, in the world of Thomas Jefferson, is just ethical good ideas as guideposts and missing the invitation to walk the talk, to live in a different way, to choose things that others don't choose, to abide by, by beliefs that make us a wonderful, faith-giving, life-giving community. And so today as we're walking about and we see the beautiful roses in the Hellerman Garden or we finally get this beautiful summer-like day, we praise God for all that he has given us. And again, welcome home. <laughs> Hello, OLPH. My name is Mary Lynn Januszewski, and I'm the Director of Finance and Operations at Our Lady of Perpetual Help Parish in Glenview, Illinois. And this message comes to you with heartfelt gratitude and thanks for your ongoing generosity and support of OLPH Parish. This overwhelming generosity allows us to continue to serve and to minister to the parish community in so many different ways. So, 
Thank you, OPH, for all you do. You are much appreciated.